this is how we figure we're a congressman. So your staff tells you how to operate things. So this is Rachel, who is my chief of staff in, in Washington, and she will explain how when we get to the question portion of things we're going to do. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here this morning. We're really glad to have you. We're happy to be here in River Tells, and as the congressman said, he's really excited to talk to everyone and answer your questions. All of you, when you came in, should have filled out a question, put it in the bucket. If you didn't, raise your hand and we'll get you a sheet so that you can fill it out and get it in. He's going to open up with a little bit, tell you a little bit about what's going on in D.C. and what he's been working on here in the district as well. So once he does that, we'll draw questions and get to your questions from there. We'll draw them. You'll ask them. When we, we'll bring them up to you. You can ask them. And then Glenn will answer. So here you go. Okay. So I'm going to answer questions out of the bucket. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, well, um, I am Glenn Grothman. I'm your congressman. I guess the first, I've had a variety of town halls around the district. I think it's the first time in two or three years uh, I have had a town hall meeting in, in River Hills, and that's because River Hills is a little bit the edge of the district. So you're familiar with the district, and this is kind of odd when I run to people from River Hills. This district goes north along Lake Michigan, all the way north of two rivers. It goes across the middle of the state, all the way to Wisconsin Dells. It goes northwest all the way up to Potoma. Uh, the biggest cities are Oshkosh, Sheboygan, Fond du Lac, Mantuac, and Neen. So it's kind of an outlier if you look at the district, the River Hills is included. It's the only part of the district that's in Milwaukee County. You know, well, it's a cool place. I run to people who run into River Hills, so I'm all excited to talk to you guys and excited to meet the afterwards to talk to some of the staff here in the Village Hall and see what's going on. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in Washington before we start things. Um, I think we've gotten more done in Washington than the public says. So I, it's disappointing to me we haven't gotten done the big things that I ran on, the big things that people are looking forward to. As far as the number of bills that Donald Trump signed in the first three months on the job, it was much higher than his contemporaries have gotten done. There's a, <coughs> we have the ability to undo certain administrative rules that the Obama administration passed near the end of its term. Uh, that is something the Congress can do with only 51 votes in the Senate, which is a little bit unusual. Um, but we, we've done 50, we've repealed 15 of those regulatory rules, including things that allow the federal government more control over, over some land use, uh, that sort of thing. And, and given that we've done 15 of those compared to one ever in the past, I think that's a good thing. We've passed several bills dealing with human trafficking, which they focused on, which for whatever reason has become a bigger, bigger, and sadder problem than we've had in the past. That's a good thing. I serve on three committees. One of those committees is the Education and Workforce Committee. We did take up a bill that I think will help um, local, give people local schools and local tech schools more flexibility as we try to have um, kids trained for the jobs that are out there. You know, this district happens to have, this is something that I wasn't aware of until I um, was involved in politics. First of all, the state of Wisconsin has the second highest percentage of jobs in manufacturing in the country. Only Indiana has a higher percentage of jobs in manufacturing. In the sixth congressional district, there are more manufacturing jobs than any other district in the country. So just kind of not think about that. 435 congressmen, more manufacturing jobs here than anywhere. But if you begin to get around the district in Oshkosh and Waupon and, and Ripon and that sort of thing, and even in Mequon in their industrial part, you see where all those jobs come from. Right now, a lot of those jobs are very good paying jobs and we can't find people to fill them. And we're going to try to redirect the, the federal dollars a little bit more, create a little bit more incentives and flexibility uh, for local units of government to make sure that people who are spending time on their education, money on their education, wind up with jobs. And a lot of those jobs have to be skill-based jobs. Um, I got a degree from the University of Wisconsin. They have a, I have a lot of degree. This is a few years ago. We have more than enough lawyers in this country. So it would be good if we get people trained in the type of jobs that construction or manufacturing. And we were able to pass that out of the Education Committee. As far as um, my other committees, uh, the Education Committee, we are going to try to do something or other with regard to student loan debt. It's a real tragedy. It's not at all to find people in their late 20s or early 30s with tens of thousands of dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. Um, 
hopefully some bill will come out of there. I am going to try to get a requirement that for student loans in the future, the college and the university sign off. I don't like to say it, but at least when I went to college, some of the uh, kids are taking out loans that was a little bit more for lifestyle choice and lifestyle enhancement than it is for, um, for an education. And it's an easy thing to do when you're 19 or 20 years old. It's a lot harder to pay off those loans when you're 35 or 40. Um, I don't think I'll succeed, but I want to put the idea out there that maybe even the college and the university themselves ought to be on the hook for some of these student loans. Because then I think they'd be a little more careful and you know try a little bit harder to make sure the kids have internships and are getting jobs. Um, I'm on the budget committee right now. We have a budget that came out of the committee. I'm a little bit disappointed in that budget. I think it's bigger spending than it should be. Donald Trump tried to present a more responsible budget. Donald Trump had about a 5.5% increase in military spending, and our military does need more money. Uh, but the budget that we're going to have to vote on collectively has over a 9% increase in military spending. I really think that's a lot of money to give the military at one time. We're going to be passing another budget a year from now. By the way, um, the federal, uh, federal budget begins on October 1st. Uh, I don't know why we couldn't increase it a year from now. We're going to have a, an audit of the military, and I quite frankly think that the people who wanted big increases got more than they should. Um, I have succeeded in cutting the increase that some people wanted by a little bit, wanted a $40 million increase over what Donald Trump proposed. I was one of the people who was able to get it down to $30 billion, but I think it should have been more than you know, maybe, maybe $10 billion more than Donald Trump proposed. Um, Donald Trump also has a significant cut to pay for it in non-military. Uh, that cut was dramatically reduced, and I don't agree with that either. I mean, we're at a point where we're going to be $20 trillion of debt. That's $60,000 for every man, woman, and child in the country. And I am kind of disappointed that the Republican Congress is not taking that more seriously than they are. They, they claim they're taking it seriously, but they're not taking it seriously enough. Um, the final committee I'm on is the Government Oversight, Oversight Committee, which deals with a variety of government scams. But in any event, uh, oh, the other thing I should address is health care reform. Uh, people were expecting Obamacare to repeat, be repealed and a replacement to be put in effect. That is going to have to be some sort of compromise bill. I voted for two bills in the House, one in committee and one on the floor of the House of Representatives. The bill on the floor of the House of Representatives, I think the 20 or 21 Republicans did not vote for it. Um, I don't like labels, but people like to label people as conservative or, or moderate Republicans. That bill had about 70 moderate Republicans not voting against it. And uh, so we just barely passed it. When it got to the Senate, there were three senators who I think kind of were digging on campaign promises and would not even vote for a placeholder to negotiate some sort of change with the House, uh, which is very disappointing. I happened to be over there that night because I thought, you know, maybe we'd see history to watch it pass. We watched it fail. I know the uh, Trump administration was working with John McCain. Mike Pence was talking to him a half hour before the vote and uh, three people decided to vote no on a placeholder bill. Um, I wish Mitch McConnell were a little bit more aggressive in trying to come back with something right away. John McCain, he voted no, didn't say he voted for nothing. He felt he didn't like, he felt the process was rushed. And if I'm Mitch McConnell and I want to get something done, I say, okay, John McCain, you think the process is rushed? We'll have some committee hearings in August. We'll get some congressional budget office uh, estimates. And then we'll come back in September and take another vote. He didn't do that, which is really disappointing. The other thing disappoints me, and this is true across the board in Congress, I wish the House and Senate were working together a little bit more on the topic. I mean, it seems to be that the editor of the House is not well, we'll let the Senate work on it. Well, eventually we're going to have to get something through both houses, so it seems to me we should have people from both houses working on something, not people on the Senate working on their plan, people on the House working on Eventually, we're going to have to take something up because Obamacare is falling apart. Um, there's going to be a time in which many counties around this country offer nothing at all on the exchange. I hope we don't wait until that happens before we do something. But because that's going to happen eventually, something will have to be done. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. And if we run out of questions, I'll tell you other interesting things. Eventually, you can. Eventually you can
can uh, ask me about tax reform, uh, ask me about welfare reform, make sure you ask me about those two important ones. But we'll see what else we have going on. Sally Alison? That's me. Want to read your question? Sure. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for holding this town hall. I appreciate Glad it. Glad to be um, My question has to do with the pardon that was issued on Friday by the president. Um, and there seem to be two areas um, that discussion has gone in. One has to do with, um, is, it, is the pardon consistent with the rule of law? And the other stream of conversation has been about, does the pardon, in fact, encourage discrimination? So I would like to ask your opinion on both pieces of that. I don't think it encourages discrimination. We have a big problem in this country on immigration, as you know. Uh, past presidents of both parties, I think to a certain extent looking out for powerful financial interests, have not done much to enforce their immigration laws. And a lot of local officials have encouraged non-enforcement of immigration laws through doing things like sanctuary cities. That's <coughs> um, nevertheless, despite the fact that you had a sea of local officials, in essence putting up a sign over their city or a sign over their county saying, we won't enforce immigration laws. The one guy who got in trouble was Sheriff Joe down there. Uh, whatever I can, can pronounce it. Arpaio. Arpaio. Um, in Arizona. And uh, he was the one who literally was facing jail time. I think uh, everybody knew when Donald Trump got elected, he expected people to take the immigration laws more seriously. And I think he was frustrated that the only person who was being punished was the only person who was trying to uphold the rule of the law. Um, I no, I'm not sure. No, he's not upholding the That's our question. I know, I know. Your issue of rule of law. He, right. He was in contempt. Well, I he think. He was convicted. I, and I, I was think. Long before Trump, the, 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 his actions that he was being tried on were from years Correct. ago. Correct. I think traditionally presidents offer pardons. They offer pardons to genuinely bad, evil people. Um, I don't think <laughs> people say that. that well, can can you they, wait, that's they, actually they, true. It was a bad, evil person. And um, I have looked into the case at, at length. But um, I think if you look to all the type of people who've got pardons in the past, you look at the President Obama pardon, President Bush pardon, President Clinton pardon, I don't uh, find some and I understand bad that there is history. I'm just right. wondering about this particular situation, and um, you know, we know what history is in, in terms of pardons, but I'm I'm asking about this particular one. Right. I think if you look at the last, and I I'd like to see a list. I haven't looked at it. Maybe I wasn't prepared for this question. I go to the last hundred people who've been pardoned by presidents. And you'd say were they good or bad people or dangerous people? I would think um, the sheriff down there in Arizona is probably about as good a person as you're going to find if you look at the last hundred people part. But you don't know specifically. H.M. Bach, I'm here. I guess I'm done. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I was wondering how uh, Trump's new strategy on the Middle East, including Afghanistan is going to be successful. Well, we don't know exactly what his strategy is. He attached to in that speech, he was kind of open-ended. I've talked to several people who've been over there. And I've been over there yet, a lot of my colleagues go over there. Um, I don't like the idea of open-ended being around there forever. On the other hand, when I talk to people who have been over there, and I like to talk to the troops because, you know, it's easy for somebody who isn't putting their life on the line to say, Let's go to Afghanistan. It's a very important part of the world. Okay, Afghanistan borders Iran. Afghanistan borders Pakistan. Afghanistan is a place where terrorists have been trained. So I think the idea that we will someday have a European-style democracy in Afghanistan is not going to happen. So what are we doing? Um, I think in case something comes up 
if it is a pair of terrorists are being trained there, uh, in case something, as we monitor what goes on in Pakistan or Iran, I think people I know who've been over there feel it's good to have a presence there. I don't think that presence is going to be, like I said, I think if, if President Bush, when he started this thing, thought he was going to turn Afghanistan to France. It wasn't going to happen. He was naive. But some of the people who've been over there, and I'll talk to a lot more people who've been over there when I get back to Washington, feel it's important to have a presence there because without some presence, other people will fill that vacuum. And they will be very bad, harmful people. But, but putting, what is it, 8,000? More troops there? Don't you think they're just <coughs> targets? Um, I mean, I just don't. Under, I mean, were you ever in the military? No, I was not. Okay, I was. Okay, and when you're in an area that is combative, it's a problem for everyone, especially if you're wearing a U.S. Army uniform. I don't believe it's going to be an aggressive. I got wrong on that. You kind of left it open ended as to how aggressive it's going to be. I think there are places around the world where we have some troops that are potentially dangerous places. In the United States, by having troops around the world, we've had a relatively peaceful last, whatever it be, 70 years around the globe. I think, like I said, with Afghan, if the Afghanistan bordering Pakistan, and bordering Iran, and historically having har harbored genuine terrorist training facilities, I think the United States having a presence is good. I do not believe that what President Trump wants to do is going to result in anywhere near the sort of casualties we had in the Obama and Bush years. And I think you may question whether President Bush was right or wrong to get involved in Afghanistan in the year 2001. But I, like I said, I think given what goes on in Pakistan, which is a volatile country, and maybe a country more Americans ought to read about, and given what goes on in Iran, and given my discussions with some people who have been over there and paid huge prices to be over there, they feel a presence is appropriate. Not a fighting presence like when we first came in there and thought we were going to take over the country, but some sort of military presence in case something goes on. And like I said, I'd be very surprised and disappointed if the casualty counts in the Trump administration for what we had under the Bush and Obama administration. Martin Hintz. Right here. I just happened to be on the Milwaukee County Board of the Wisconsin Farm Bureau. We've got a whole farm here. Good. And I appreciate your support of the scientific community uh, through your education committee work and encouraging uh, young people to try that, not just manufacturing, but also farming. Uh, but also uh, your support for that, but acknowledging that the human impact on climate change, which is a big challenge for us as farmers here in Wisconsin, as well as throughout the rest of the country and the world, what legislation have you been advancing to protect Wisconsin's clean air and water and also on a national level so that farmers can produce good crops, our children and grandchildren have clean air, clean water to survive into the next couple of generations? Well, first of all, as you know, um, the air and water in Wisconsin are both much cleaner than they were when I was a child. Okay, I'm not sure we need a lot of new legislation in that area. And we have a Department of Natural Resources, we have an Environmental Protection Agency that do a lot to make sure our air and water are clean. Cutting the back on our water, 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 money flowing to the Great Lakes Initiative that Donald Trump tried to get rid of all together. So I guess you could say that I'll, I'll take part of the responsibility for that money continuing to flow and keeping our Great Lakes clean. 
Um, but otherwise, I think we're in a position here in which the current laws are largely good enough. I mean, um, groundwater is a little bit more of a state issue than a federal issue. But like I said, I think if you look, one of the things we have to educate the young people on is how much cleaner the air is today compared to when I was a child. When I was a child, I don't think we thought things were that bad. They might have been bad in Los Angeles, they might have been bad in Pittsburgh. They weren't that bad around here. Whether they go particulate matter, whether you look at ozone, the air is much cleaner than it used to be. I think you look at the Milwaukee River, and I should know, does Milwaukee River go through the rails? Does it go through the rails? Yes, it does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Um, the Milwaukee River was much cleaner was than I was a child. I grew up in the so I know what the Milwaukee River was like 40 years ago. Much cleaner today than it was at that time, and it's going to continue to get cleaner uh, because the rules that are in effect now. So you'll continue supporting initiatives to ensure that we. Uh, I, I am on the lookout. I do not want to go back to where we were. You know, whether you look at wildlife or you look at fish, even though fish isn't exactly what you're addressing. I can look at the type of fish that I'm like here compared to 40 years ago. I don't tell you how much cleaner it is today than it used to be, right? That's accurate. Are you watching what the are doing in the Environment Protection Agency? And it's sort of been operating quietly but effectively. And some putting it effective is problematic. Or, um, so making sure he's yeah. not rolling back. I want to make sure that I want to make sure that we take the questions out of the bucket because that's how everyone submitted, so everyone gets a chance to ask. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure. We're, we're, I think we're ahead of the game here. So yeah. Josh Schmidt. Hi. You know why not? Thank you for coming. Sure. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to do kind of a question and answer. That that's why I'm going to stand here. Oh, we can't. Mm -hmm. be. Well, on two major issues which kind of fold together. Uh, one is Russian interference. I just read an opinion piece on Fox that acknowledges that Russia did in fact interfere with the 2016 election. Uh, so do you believe that this is a witch hunt, or do you believe what Fox News is opinionating on that this wasn't bad? Well, I, I haven't read their opinions. I don't think Russia had an impact on this election. Okay, that's question number one. Thank you for answering that. Do you feel that the... Uh, sanctity of our democracy and the vote, given that you don't feel Russia interfered, I'm assuming you think that the democracy is in good hands right now concerning potential future uh, interference by Russia or another country. Well, I don't know what you mean by interference. I don't like um, when other countries take sides around here. I don't like that, you know, in the last election, I don't know who Russia would have wanted to have win. I mean, obviously, they, they gave a lot of money for Bill Clinton to give a speech, which I thought was maybe inappropriate. Um, and I don't know that was a sign that they felt sure. that, that they could control one okay. candidate more than the other. But the, the, the one word answer is Russia did not interfere with 2016. They didn't have an effect. How about a one word answer? To they the did not. Can. Was there a witch hunt? Wait, 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 wait. Like the president. I'll, I'll put it this way. I don't think whatever Russia did affected this election. Thank you. I Thank talked you for a long time. Very good. Um, I've talked to a lot of people uh, during the campaign. Okay. We had a lot of people that good. gave me reasons why they voted for this candidate, reasons why they voted for that candidate. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of them mentioned anything that would have to do with Russia. Sounds good. I so, think so, cut and dry in Russia does not involve. Which I, leads to I, Trump's I, taxes. I'm sorry, Donald well, Trump's taxes. Okay. Two well, House Republicans, Mark Sanford of South Carolina, Walter Jones, these are your colleagues in North Carolina. I'm sure you've had lunch with them. You know them. They are urging, and again, these are Republican House members. Uh, do you know these two members? Uh, Walter Jones and Mark Sanford? Yep. Okay. So they are urging Donald Trump to release his taxes, his tax documents going back one decade. So that's two colleagues of yours, which leads me to ask, do you believe President Trump should release his tax returns Yes or no? Going back well, I'll put it like on the tax returns. I think so the answer is no. They don't they believe he should release his tax returns. Well, I'm, I'm not concerned sure about you. yours. I'm concerned about what you feel as my I, representative I, I believe about the president's. It's a yes or no answer, answer, sir. You don't have to interrupt me all the time. But it's a yes or no answer. Do you believe he should be tax I'm not going to put up with you interrupting me all the time. Okay. Um, I think 
it has been common for presidents to release their tax returns. I think also presidents in the past have had relatively uncontroversial tax returns, okay? And Would the controversy be possible about Russia's tax can you, you know, um, I think, you know, I think an average politician's tax return will look kind of like my tax return, okay? It's going to be a, a I was in the state legislature, the bulk of the income came from the state of Wisconsin, now the bulk of the income is your taxes paying for my salary. Donald Trump, I assume, has a rather odd, or a different tax, not odd, but a different sort of tax return, and I assume that's one of the reasons why he hasn't released it. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if, for example, he didn't pay taxes, because if you are in the real estate business, if you know anybody who has a lot of apartments and that sort of thing, it's not unusual not to pay taxes. I think a lot of people um, don't realize that by the time you get done with the appreciation, it, it, until you sell the buildings, that is a norm. You can say we've got to change the tax law, so it's not a norm, but it's a norm. And I have watched on a state level politicians being attacked by people who don't understand that. If they have you know, some years not paying income taxes. In the state of Wisconsin, you can, it's a public record, you can find out that everybody paid an income tax. Gotcha. So yes or no, I'm sorry, this is so only a lot of time. Uh, okay, okay. okay. alright. You're, 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 you're beating him up. I gave you a one answer question. Do you believe, as my representative, he should release his tax documents for the next year? Sure not. I would this is who I am. I, mean, I forgot. But it's, so, I don't know if I'm just beating around the bush. Um, Congressman, yes or no, do you believe he should his tax return? I, I appreciate it. It's not a okay, so your answer is it's on the open. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you come back to the question. I'm going to go ahead and ask one. Ben, throw up hammer. And I believe you should introduce legislation like I phoned you six times to make it necessary for all candidates, the president and vice president, to release their tax returns. Will you introduce that legislation? Please sit down. It's my son's Here. turn. It's, yeah. Uh, you it's were going to give this man time. Suddenly you're not going to get Excuse me. Time. It's my son's well, turn. You, you had two questions. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just said we had all day. Will you introduce that legislation? No, we don't have all day. Yes. 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 I don't have all day. We don't have all day. Okay. So if there's no answer to the answer, we're going to legislate. I've got several calls at your office. I'm focusing on welfare reform, tax reform, Balancing the budget. And the committee on the second government line. reform, which watches the so investigation English. of the. Please sit down, it's my son's turn. Well, I guess we can wait to the question of no, will he introduce legislation no, no, to no. demand no, that presidential no. candidates so release their tax returns going to. Questions. Questions. Do you need to move on to the next People have caught that. No answer. Oh, yeah, no, All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, sir. Is our welfare system sustainable if no work can plan to? No, the welfare system is a huge problem. Um, we have an example. Of, uh, we have a situation that a lot of people are not familiar with, which a lot of people are obviously intentionally not um, earning as much money as they could or being productive as they could, because we have so many programs out there, the more you work, the more you lose. And whether you add up the food stamps or the income housing or health care benefits or um, grants to a college, it does create a situation. If you talk to employers, you talk to people who know people like this, in which people say, I can't make more than X amount of money. We talk a lot today about the income gap. I'd like to see the day come in which everybody's making, you know, 50 or 70 or $100,000, but we're not going to be making next to 50 or 70 or $100,000, and that's just not easy first start making thirty or forty thousand dollars and right now there are a lot of people I think are voluntarily uh, not making as much money as they should. The other problem with all these welfare programs is they're based on our son of poverty. It's easier to be in poverty if you're not married to somebody with an income. So if you have a couple, they have a child and uh, say the father is making fifty thousand dollars a year if the couple get married, they're no longer in poverty and lose all the programs. If they set them, if the mother says, I'm, I'm not going to get married, she has a variety of programs. Uh, so again, we have a situation which is just pretty discouraging marriage. I think this is probably the biggest problem affecting America today because it affects the moral fiber of America. You are telling people they shouldn't work hard, and you're telling people they shouldn't get married if they have children. 
and both those things are bad, you might have destroyed your family, you might have quitting people, uh, not spending their life, never having a job, but spending their life having jobs in which they don't reach the threshold in which they lose all the government benefits. It's something Congress has to go after. I have tried aggressively to get Paul Ryan to bring something up here. He originally said he was going to try to bring up something next year. He then went back and told me he was going to try to bring up something this year. I wish I saw more aggressiveness, quite frankly, on this topic. And I'm disappointed we haven't had more aggressiveness because I think, A, it's popular, and uh, we, Congress's popularity rating is not that high right now, so we would make Congress and the President more popular. But secondly, you have got to get back to more values of both, both America. And we're not going to get those values as long as the sizable segment of American society is given strong financial benefits. Do you want that? Like corporate welfare? Bridget Delage? Yeah. Where was this? Oh, okay. Thanks for coming. I uh, have a son in college. I'm um, up in uh, Oshkosh, and he's an environmental studies major. And so um, thinking about him and his future and his family's future, I want to pose this question. At the Nina Town Hall last spring, you were asked your opinion on global warming. You said you would look at it. Now that you've had time to do so, would you agree with 97% of the world's climate scientists who believe that global warming trends are going to be human activity? Um, well, when I say I'll look at it, I think we need more years in to determine whether we have trends here. I don't think the global temperatures have gone up uh, by very much over the last dozen or so years. Um, I think if you look over a period of history, you know, there are cold years and warm years and cold decades and warm decades and cold centuries and warm centuries. Um, when I was a, in high school or college, they talked about global cooling. And there were scientists who were quoted in Newsweek magazine or such um, saying we're going to have a huge catastrophe by now. That they wouldn't be able to grow wheat in Canada because it was going to be so cold in Canada. And therefore, we're going to have you know, facing maybe world starvation. And I can't remember what they recommended doing at that time. But I'm sure whatever they recommended would have been very expensive. And I had a huge impact on people. Fortunately, Congress in the 1970s did react to the global cooling thing, and nothing happened. Uh, now we're in a situation right now in which I don't think we've had any horrible things happen because of Houston. How much is the rain? Yeah, That's one degree temperature. Um, I don't like to with everybody's question, but I will say, I you did, said, you to, said a lot I of did have to read this morning. You said a lot of Somebody degrees. brought something up. I, I did read this morning that this was the most serious hurricane in many, many years. Now, we went almost an historically long period of time without bad hurricanes. Well, that to me is an indication of a good thing. We went a very, very long period of time, <coughs> almost an historically long period of time without a big hurricane. Now we have a big hurricane, and people are going to say, ah, 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 we have a big hurricane. Ignoring the fact that we've always had big hurricanes, it went a long period of time. Right. But you're also aware that like, video plays are all over there? Um, and that has changed? The warming of the, the, warming of the oceans? You think that's, that's why we haven't had hurricanes? Yes. That's why we yes. have hurricanes. Well, I mean, it, it seems to me whenever something bad happens, but you don't happen, know. they blame you're the for climate change. And I do think over time, you know, we have droughts. Back to middle times, the good things, bad things. I don't think we have enough information to spend billions or trillions of dollars. Really? Really? Is that really? the way scientists are? Well, well, I. Uh, I mean, so. Uh, it, it, I, I read scientists who don't think it's, it's that big a deal. So, like I said, I think rather than spend trillions of dollars, when the United States, I think, compared to other countries, has already done so much. Um, and make life more expensive to people who sometimes can't afford to have life be made a lot more expensive. I mean, it's an easy thing that people are wealthy to say, you know, I don't care if my electric bill goes up X amount every month because for them it's no big deal. Also, that Newsweek story was debunked years ago. Years ago. Years and years ago. The Newsweek story debunked. I wonder if you're talking about.
The one you referred to in the 70s. Right, well, that's right, not to be true. But I mean, scientists were quoted in there, I'm sure, you know, intelligent. Yeah, people. but even at the time, there weren't 97% of the scientists saying the world was being a little bit. Well, somebody did. Okay. <laughs> somebody lied. All right, Kathy Brockhammer. Thank you for taking my question. Just wondering, how are we going to fix the national debt? That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so easy. Yes, we start by building a wall. So I'm very frustrated. Uh, I am disappointed in the Republicans so far. I don't think addressing the problem in the degree in which they should. I think Donald Trump introduced a budget recognizing the problem. Uh, there's no way you're going to balance the budget in one year, just because it's not realistic. But I think you have to keep taking steps down that path. Right now, our budget, about 70% is what they call mandatory spending, and 30% is discretionary. The only thing we have to vote on every year is the discretionary spending. But you should be tackling mandatory spending. In the budget that is out there right now, it is still not as good as it should be. For the first time in like something like 20 years, quite a while, we're trying to do something with mandatory spending. They are trying to rein in mandatory spending by $200 billion over the next 10 years. That's a drop in the bucket. But I'll take some of the credit for them doing that because I'm on the budget committee and I've screamed enough that at first they were 150, now that they are 200. Um, when I get back to Washington, I'm going to do all in my power to make sure we get a higher number than that. As I said, I think um, we held down military spending from what some people wanted, but they should be spending less. I am very disappointed that so far the powers that be have listened to people who have said we can barely cut discretionary spending more than 1%. I'm very disappointed with whoever's come up with that number. Um, and I think part of the problem is people with the most influence right now are people who've been around there for a long period of time on some key committees. Republican leadership have decided to give too much power. Um, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's a disappointment so far. I'll tell you that. Um, we haven't passed the budget. We haven't passed the appropriation bill. But um, I, I think in part because of the service atmosphere on some other issues and because of all the focus on health care, what's going on in the budget has not been picked up on enough by certain voices that normally complain about Congress. And I wish they would pick up on apply some pressure to Congress. I can tell you I'm applying a tremendous amount of pressure behind the scenes as one out of 435. And I think I'm holding down, I'm, I'm making the current budget less irresponsible than it would be otherwise. But um, in this job, even more than Madison, of course, I was in the state legislature for a long period of time, people come through your office and ask for work on And I think it's human nature to try to make people happy. But I think we need stronger leadership. Um, Fighting that fight. I think Donald Trump proposed a more responsible budget that was going to get passed, and I think he was persuaded that it was an impossible thing to get done. I wish Donald Trump would have kept fighting. I still hope he fights. And if I ever get a hold of him, I want to get a hold of him. But obviously, it's there's so many of us, it's not like you just pick up the phone and they say, he's got you know, time next Monday at 10 o'clock, stop by. I wish that's the way it is. Uh, I will tell him not to shoot fight harder because I think right now he's listening to some people in Congress who tell him that it's impossible and better not be impossible. Thanks, <coughs> Congressman, there's so an easier I, answer. Just I, hire the Clintons and I get it from Russia. Uh, I have to actually ask a follow up. Thank you for coming to River Hills. I, we talked about this. I know, so thank you for coming to our little River Hills because I know you're just late. And I'm sorry for your loss. I just want to follow up on your question, which is a good one. But one of the things that, because I know you're so concerned about debt, 
I'm wondering how you feel about the large tax cuts that are being given to the wealthiest families in the proposed budget. Because one way to save money is to not pass <clears throat> those tax cuts to the people who are in the best position to help pay for what is done. I'd be very vocal that I think the tax cuts ought to focus on the middle class. And I am disappointed with the proposal that's out there. I am glad that Donald Trump has been publicly critical of the House plan. Because I do think the House plan was aimed a little bit too much at people living off investment income and not enough at the guy who's working third shift at a factory or a nurse or a truck driver or what have you. Um, I think, hopefully, the most of the tax cuts are financed by getting rid of tax loopholes. We had a gentleman before, you know, talk about corporate welfare. And I'd like to see a list of what he refers to as corporate welfare, but there are certainly tax code provisions out there that I think, you know, hypothetically, corporate welfare is supposed to help generate good economic activity. But a lot of that corporate welfare offends me, and I hope what they do is they get rid of some tax credits and tax deductions, and then put it in the tax code and reduce uh, the marginal rates for the middle class. So if the bill goes forward in the format that we've seen, which has these large tax cuts, will you then oppose it? Will you vote against it? Well, the, the bill that's even out there doesn't have the details filled in. There are two broad frameworks out there. There's the Trump framework, and there's the Ways and Means framework. And both of them do not have the details filled in. And when you look at a tax bill, it's kind of all about the details. I used to do taxes years ago, and I was around when we had two major um, tax reforms during the Reagan years. And I know you can do some really dumb things. And there's some really dumb things. So in do you area. propose eliminating the AMT and lowering the rate on margin rate on pass-through? Do you oppose those cuts? Well, um, I think the alternative minimum tax can be problematic. I mean, it can result in things that... Like Trump paying tax. I, I, I don't know why Trump, assuming he didn't pay tax, why he didn't pay tax and didn't pay tax. I think that there are proposals out there right now that we, we do not want taxes to affect economic decisions. That is a mistake. When I began to do taxes years ago through limited partnerships, people of means could not pay taxes if they bought if they bought into limited partnerships with real estate. And for those in the room old enough to know, I know we had them in Milwaukee, but you'd have what they call see-throughs, in which people invested in skyscrapers that they didn't have anybody even renting, but it was a way to prevent wealthy people from paying tax. Um, I think right now they're talking about 100 percent expensing of real estate, which on the face of it, the idea that if I have tax liability <coughs> I can buy a $300,000 apartment building and depreciate the whole $300,000 in the first year is just silly. It's going to result in people buying things they shouldn't buy, and because you're 100% depreciated, it's going to cause people not selling things they want to sell. But that idea is out there in a ways and means proposal that I think some think tank person thought of that makes no sense. So, and, and again, Donald Trump has been publicly critical of the initial house proposal as being targeted towards the rich. And I hope he continues that line of thinking and does not allow himself to keep it. So I guess if I could just circle back, because I have a daughter who's probably about your age, she's 27. I think you all are going to carry the tax burden if, if, we don't, if we don't do things to make things better. And again, if something ends up on the floor of the house, where the there are tax cuts to the rich. I understand the details are not, but are you willing to say now no. that you would vote against it? Well, I don't know what you mean by that, because you look at the details. Look, we are going to have to have a corporate income tax cut. Okay, we right now I don't have, mean the that. Highest, I'm, okay. we have the highest 
corporate tax. I'm not talking about the corporate yeah, tax. I'm the, talking about yeah, the other. We have the highest corporate tax in the industrialized world. We right now have, a, have a tax on repatriation tax, which an American company makes money abroad. If they take it back to the United States, they face a big tax. So they'd rather keep the investment in Europe or Asia or somewhere than bring it back home. Those things are going to, I believe, in the long run, improve the economy, more jobs, higher income, more, uh, more good economy. I guess I wasn't economy. thinking about corporate tax. I was thinking about wealth tax the, the, and the... It, it, it depends on how it's put together. Okay. Okay. All right. Christine Ralph. I, I, I'm going to make one more comment on that because I want, I want people to understand something about taxes. Are you familiar with the Laffer curve? You should know about the Laffer curve. We're probably going to learn about the Laffer curve. The Laffer curve, if you decide to set the rates, okay, and your rate is at zero percent, how much tax are you going to get? Zero, right? If you put the tax at 100 percent, what type of return are you going to get? Zero. At first blush, you'd say, I'm going to put the tax at 100%, I'm going to get unlimited. But if you put it at 100%, nobody's going to pay it. Nobody's going to work. Nobody's going to invest it. Everybody goes to the government. So as you reduce the top corporate rate, or individual rate as well, people for a while pay more and more tax. Right? It, it, because if you're at 90%, people say, well, maybe I'll work a little bit. They say, 10% on my income, 8%, 70% all the way. We right now, even on the top, top rate, arguably, people are, apart from the fact that we don't like to take money from people because it's just unfair and we're supposed to be a free country and the idea that if I work and earn another dollar, the government says 45% of that money is mine, is on the face of it ridiculous and, and hypothetical freedom. But it is also true that it is good if people pay it's good if people's decisions in life are not based on the tax consequences. And when you have, together with state taxes, when you have people paying taxes at over 40%, it affects the way they behave. It affects the way they invest. It affects whether they decide to work more. Um, there's a, a guy I ran into, and I think this would not be practical. He said, why don't, if you want the economy to take off, why don't you get rid of the income tax on overtime? He's probably right, because right now in overtime, people are probably paying tax at 40%, including state tax, and we're not, we don't have as productive society as we should. So you've got to remember that when you cut tax rates to a degree, you're getting a lot more economic activity. And it is good, and, and when you do have rates on anything, a corporation on an individual, over 40%, which we do today, you are causing people to make decisions in which they have less income. Not to mention, uh, even for wealthy people, it just doesn't seem right that if I work and earn another dollar, the government would take over 40%. Okay. So yeah, yeah, that's okay. a nice question. Okay. Sorry. I put my two years on. Yeah, okay. A July 2017 University of Texas study shows a clear causal link between the statewide defunding of Planned Parenthood in Texas and other family planning services and an increase in the rates of both unplanned pregnancies and abortions. A 2016 study by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists reported that the rate of pregnancy-related deaths in Texas have doubled since the state defunded family planning. In light of these negative outcomes, why do you still support the defunding of Planned Parenthood? I think Planned Parenthood is an organization that stands for a lot of things. A lot of Americans, including myself, find offensive. I think Planned Parenthood uh, aggressively pushes contraceptives on very young people, and I think most parents would be upset if they found that their young people were engaged in sexual activity at such a young age. I think Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider in the United States. And certainly by a mile, the largest abortion provider in the state of Wisconsin. I think Planned Parenthood, insofar as they um, influence education in the schools, um, are push things on kids that I think are, 
are too young for that and not too young. I, I, I went to Marquette University and I used Planned Parenthood in college not only for contraception but for exams and 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 I didn't have health care then and I went on to serve the military and I went on to have a successful career and pay taxes and I think that was an investment in me and, and, and I appreciate that. And I think there's so many other women that are in the same boat. And don't you want those women to have access to reproductive care? How else would you provide? If you mean the pill, I think women can have access to the pill That's without right. going to Planned Parenthood. That's right. Exams. That's exams. Exams. I have people. people I have we, have, we have badger care in this state. We have Medicaid statewide <coughs> or nationwide in which people are able to go to medical professionals who don't work for Planned Parenthood. I mean, I don't know in Milwaukee County here how many clinics we have, but it's got to be. So how do you explain what happens, what happens in Texas when they defund the county funding? Um, are those good results? I'm not sure that there's a, a causal thing going on there. I really don't. I mean, I've talked to uh, I've talked to people in Milwaukee about their programs, and I think I think some of them would tell you the less Planned Parenthood oriented they are, the more success they. Have. I do not believe. Yeah, I, I do not believe an organization that believes it's a good thing to put very young people on contraceptives, 13 and 14 girls on contraceptives. They, they, they've never yeah. been in the public schools, by the way. They've yeah. never been in K-12 education, Planned Parenthood has never stepped foot through the doors of K-12 education. I was in Washington or Madison, and they weigh in strongly on the type of, pole, on the type of uh, uh, health education. Teaching. No, that, Absolutely. That's, that's inaccurate. I worked in education for all of my life. They, they allowed me. Planned Parenthood does not step I, into I, I don't like to in take, Wisconsin. I don't like to take people out of county. But I'll say this. I was a state legislature for many years. We passed laws about human growth and development. And I don't think anybody had stronger opinions of waiting more than Planned Parenthood. Now, they might not weigh in directly in your school, but it doesn't mean they and their suggested programs, uh, they don't weigh in the state legislators. And I assume there's surrogates way in public schools. So do you think well, abstinence is the alternative? Well, I think a whole lot of parents, probably correctly so, expect their parents <coughs> to abstain from sex. And the success, actually. Well, well, well Joe Allen Schultz, that's all I have is time. I defer to you, Pat, a few more questions. I'll turn my time over. <laughs> I, I just, uh, you know, I know so many women that Planned Parenthood has made a difference in diagnosing um, diseases early on. Yes. I've worked in women's health for over 30 years in mental health capacity, not in physical health capacity. So I saw women directly affected by not being funded for services. And it's painful for me to know that her statistics are accurate, but I don't hear what you're proposing as an alternative. What is we we what have is the alternative? health care programs for the poor galore. And these proposals and these programs like do not what? require like you what? to go to Planned Parenthood. Medicaid, 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 Medicaid. You, you have, you have. Uh, do you know there's not? There are very few psychiatrists who serve people with Medicare. Well, I think we're talking Medicaid. about reproductive health. Well, and mental health, health, which is affected by reproductive health issues. I mean, it's all women's health. And I still work with that population, and I experience it all the time. Where Planned Parenthood is really the only the option. option, and it continues to save people's to lives. Right. And saving we, people's we lives is what we need to do. Care. Won't that improve once we get rid of Obamacare? <clears throat> Which part? Well, Obamacare. it improved yeah. under Obamacare. Yes. There are. It will. It will decline. It is a tiny people. fraction of what they do, and there are clinics all over the place. Not to mention there are also some free clinics. Not to mention Planned Parenthood's not going to disappear because perhaps people like can give them money to vote. So, um, what does that mean? People like people like people like people Planned Parenthood is fundraisers. I know. They have fundraisers because sometimes I don't like what kind of people are they? Are they communists? No, no. I think people are in favor of Planned Parenthood. So people are. I I give I give money to charity in my own right. I assume you give money to charity. Because Planned Parenthood, I think, has... Yeah, sure, our congressman. Right. 
And so what you're saying really clearly is you do not want women's health care to be taken care of by Planned Parenthood. I don't want taxpayer dollars going to it. Not at all. I, I, think, it, I think their worldview is opposed by many people, including myself. Do you and have any If individual people want to give money to them, then they're going to give money to them. Yeah. All right. Paul Gordon? <coughs> there it is. I know he did. Okay. One quick comment. When I elect, I don't know what, my vote for people, I assume we have. They don't know everything. They know little about everything. Not much about specifics, just like most people. And I rely upon them to seek out expert advice. And I would hope that you and your colleagues do that. And concern about the climate change issue, because what I'm seeing is that people aren't relying on experts and come to their conclusions. With that, I'll move on to. Um, I guess my first question. Um, there is a lawsuit pending before the Supreme Court dealing with um, congressional districts, abortion, etc. Um, you raised the issue through a number of comments. And I'll criticize you for not knowing whether the river is in River Hills or not. I don't. And I think there are boundary issues. I don't criticize you for not being sure how many uh, clinics still are in Milwaukee. Um, and I'm not criticizing you in that sense, but I do ask two questions. One, do you support the lawsuit? You know, which outcome would you support? Number two, do you think that you ought to be representing River Hills when, I'll say, I'm a Democrat, okay? When Jim <laughs> Sensenbrenner was my, and he knows it, when Jim Sensenbrenner was my congressman, he had a different viewpoint on hot button issues than did Tom Barrett when he was my congressman. My congressmen have, have, have changed, you know, more than I like to say. That being said, you take away the hot button issues, Jim Sensenbrenner and Tom Barrett represented the Milwaukee general area pretty much the same. They understood Milwaukee. They probably introduced legislation, voted for legislation that helped the Milwaukee area, they're familiar with them. Your main constituency is a different community, a different geographic uh, area. Yeah. We're the rats cap here in River Hills, a very small area that's been carved out. And do you believe that you can adequately represent us? Do you believe, more important, uh, that you should be our congressman? It's a blast. I love you guys. Okay. I'll say this. I agree with you. If your if your correct criticism is that it's you not a great one. It's not. It's, I'm not, it's not. Okay. I'm not criticizing. Right. I'm not criticizing you as our congressman. I am talking about political apportionment. The fact that you you know now only I believe in the West Bend Slinger area, nice area, um, but geographically very different in terms, much in terms of needs, what have you, and yet. You have this very small community, 1,600 residents, and maybe a little bit more that you're picking up. Does it make sense? Do you really believe that that's the way it should be? Yeah, I think I think you're. And any answer in terms of whether you're for or against the plaintiffs in the lawsuit? Well, I think the plaintiffs in the lawsuit okay. want more diversity within districts. As I understand it, the plaintiffs in the lawsuit wish every congressional district was about a 50-50 district. Now, I would say of the eight congressmen in Wisconsin, every congressman has diverse districts. It is true I represent a primarily agriculture-based economy in Wishar, Marquette County. I've got some tourism in Green Lake and Wisconsin Dells. I have a big industrial district, and I have a suburban district in Cedarburg, Grafton. <coughs> And I think if you look at almost every congressman in Wisconsin, maybe not Gwen Moore, you can say the same thing. Look at Paul Ryan's district. He's got some areas of, of poverty in Racine. He's got some wealthier suburbs in, in Waukesha County. He has some farm in Rock County. Uh, you look at the um, 
So, the yeah, you look at uh, Mark Bocan, um, who's a little bit uh, southwest of me. He's got Madison, which is a unique city like nothing else in the in the state. But on the other hand, he has some um, um, poor areas of Malloy and agriculture areas. I mean, you're not going to have, given the size of the districts, that they have and they should be. As far as not knowing here, I was being a little bit rhetorical when I said, does the Milwaukee River go through here? Because I, I grew up in Thieves, and Milwaukee River goes, you know, it's the border between Thieves and Mac 1. I was just trying to drag them on right, my right, side right, forever. Right, 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 but you know what I mean? The point yeah, I was I mean, making really, was, I, I, you know, I've been hanging around the Milwaukee area my whole life. I was born in Milwaukee. I, my earliest years were spent in the city of Milwaukee. I, I, um, I grew up in Thienesville and my, uh, my mom still lives there. Mm -hmm. So as far as this part of my district, I've been hanging around here my whole life. Yeah, but I, if, I, if I lived here for 40 years and then I went up to, and, and I went up to those areas, you know, I could write to Congress and, and make a case and maybe they, they vote for me, but as a, a Congress person, it's not you personally, whether you lived here and whether you know this, but your interest and your constituency has needs that are distinct from a very large area. You've got this one place parked out, and it's an example of what's going on around the country. And people argue that's why we're so far apart, that all of the races for these seats are a moderate versus a liberal or moderate versus a conservative, and we're getting further and further apart in Congress. Sheboygan was just sparked up, so you take the Democratic area and turn it into, you know, several just tales of Republican districts. And they're saying, and so the question is, are you in favor of political gerrymandering? Are you for or against the lawsuit? And really, should well, somebody, not you as an individual, should a congressperson who represents a very large area that's in distinct character from another area, be <coughs> representing them simply so you can get another vote? Well, again, in the house. I, I believe yeah. some of these decisions, I think one of your criticisms of me is apparently not a criticism of the map. This isn't yeah. about you, Yeah, criticism of the map. Yeah. is that I have to represent River Hills people who might have a different view of the world than Oshkosh people who might have a different view of the world than Wachona people. And I think it's kind of neat, actually, that I have a very diverse district. Um, I do believe that at least some court decisions are, that I think you probably agree with, are aiming more towards the way that the district should be more diverse. In other words, that they don't like it that, say, Gwen Moore's district to the south of the year is whatever it is, 75% Democrat or something, and that every district around the state should be gerrymandered to be 50-50, because Wisconsin's about a 50-50 state. Um, I think that's odd. I don't think the lines in Wisconsin are really that unusual. I mean, if you stop and think about it, there should be, you know, it seems to make sense to me that Milwaukee is in the same district and the suburbs right around it that are similar to, to it. I think you're always going to have a district bordered by Lake Michigan and, and the Illinois border that Paul Ryan represents. You're always going to have Racine Kenosha together and just a little bit more than that. Madison will always dominate one district. You're always going to have one district up in Mississippi River. Um, my district is not, obviously kind of floats because it's kind of between all these other districts to kind of have to be where they are. But, I don't think this is a bad district. And personally, I like the fact that maybe compared to other districts, it's diverse. I mean, I have some counties that are, I am told, some of the poorer counties in the state. And I haven't looked at the figures, the locals tell me they are anyway, to in the northwestern part of my district. River Hills may well be the wealthiest city in the state, so a village in the state. So, you know, I have strong manufacturing. I have five private universities. I have many prisons. I have in Columbia County, you have a lot of people who work in Madison, government employees there. So it's kind of cool that you have all, the, all these different things. So that you would thing. not favor the, the uh, people you want 
to eliminate political gerrymandering. In the case before the Supreme Court, you would not be on their side of the issue. And you would hope that the Supreme Court would not. I don't think the Supreme Court should draw the lines. And that's what you're going to wind up with. I mean, either going to hang out with the elected officials draw the lines, or you're going to have a court draw the lines. Now, that's not well. Look, well, they could revamp. They could revamp. Oh, yeah. That would be done. I, I, but, yeah. Right, right now, this is like my understanding is that the courts will intervene where there is discriminatory gerrymandering, race, and what have you, which is a unique um, issue that has to do with whether they intervene where there is political gerrymandering. Somebody here may be smarter than I am. Correct me on that. Um, okay, so I, I, you're not. So you would not be in favor I, of the courts intervening. I don't believe so. No. Okay. One of one of a very quick comment. Like, what time is it? Yeah, we gotta get going. Otherwise, we're gonna be fine. What time is it right now? It's uh, twelve ten. Okay. I'll, I'll give you one more question, just because you're such a nice guy. Like <laughs> my Democrat friends. Right. <laughs> it's not a question. Just. The, the sheriff in Arizona. It's very important. It's not a question of that that sheriff, sheriff is an evil person. Right? No matter. It is the fact that a law enforcement officer chose for 17 months to ignore the direct order of a court of law. And that undermines democracy. It's fundamental. That's my view of it. And it's not that he was doing whether he's pro-immigration against it or he thinks that he was right and the court was wrong. It's not the society that we have or ever have had. God help us when the day comes that it's law enforcement officers who decide whether to abide by a court's order. That's particularly in such an important partnership. That's that's the right <laughs> That's really an important one. This Don't forget that one. Right now as a country. We are... It's right with the monitor. No, I don't see what you're saying. I don't see what you're saying. It is important. 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 The courts reach the right decision and people always obey the courts. That is very true. It's the second part of this question. So the courts the one. They, you still have to follow it because they are one part of the government, one part of the government. Like, they do reach the wrong decision. We are in a very, well, it's hard. We are at a very critical time because people have to respect.